Thank you. All right, we're ready to start, so your talking ends and mine begins. Um, I do want to tell you, and I, I respect the fact that everybody has their own morals and that type of thing. This is a discussion, we're going to talk about some things that uh, might be morally against what you believe, but will be a reality of what happened in the 60s. And we're going to talk about things like violence in the 60s and the drug culture in the 60s. We're going to talk about the sexual revolution, which is a little sexual. And we're going to tell you some things that might seem quiet. We're going to tell you some things that might seem a little off color, but they are things that happened in the 60s. And so if you're uncomfortable with that, you can sure let me know, and if it's something you don't want to listen to, you can get it off the video. It's not horrible, but it is a little different than what we've been doing. So we're going to break the colorful and colorless 60s into several different topics. This test material will deal with violence in the 1960s. It'll deal with the drug culture in the 1960s in the United States. And it will deal with the counterculture movement of American youth in the 1960s, including the sexual revolution, Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco, California, Woodstock's, Woodstock, and then the dangers of the counterculture movement. So we're going to start with violence in the 1960s. Now I'm going to give you some statistics here about violence in the 60s and some things that led to violence in the 60s. So the first bit of information I'll give you under violence in the 1960s is murders, muggings, and rapes doubled during the decade of the 1960s compared to any other decade before in the United States. Again, murders, muggings, and rapes doubled during the decade of the 1960s compared to any other decade prior to that. Murders, muggings, and rapes doubled. There were twice as many of those types of crimes during the 1960s than any other decade previous. As far as murders went, you have 100% of murders in the United States in the 1960s. 33% of murders committed were committed by members of the person's immediate family. Okay, so 33% of the murders that occurred in the 1960s were committed by family members. 33% of the murders during this time were committed by family members. Another 33% of all murders during the 60s were committed by friends. So you had a 66% chance if you were murdered in the 1960s to either be murdered by a member of your family or a friend. Only 33% of all murders during the 1960s were committed by people they didn't know. 33%. So six, about 33.3, I mean you can look at it. But a third of the murders in the 1960s were committed by family members. A third of the murders committed in the 1960s were committed by friends, and a third of the murders committed in the 1960s were done by people that, that, that the victim didn't know. So you had a 66.6% .6 chance of being murdered by either a family member or someone you knew, a friend, than you did someone you didn't. Now, anybody know, any, any, anybody know what the gun homicide rate is? You girls are probably gun shooters. What, you know, McGarvin, what's the gun, what does gun homicide rate mean? Gun homicide rate, like people who have been killed by guns. That's absolutely. The gun homicide rate in the United States in the 1960s, this would be people that were murdered by guns, was 40 times the gun homicide rate anywhere else in the world. In the 1960s, the gun homicide rate in the United States was 40 times more than the gun homicide rate anywhere else in the world. So you can see a pattern of violence in the 1960s that we had not seen in our American history prior to that. And I'm going to give you some specific reasons or some specific examples of violence. The first one that's on your sheet is the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War was a violent event during the 1960s. Well, give me an example of why it was a violent event. Why would it affect Americans? Yeah. 
besides those fighting. Oh, I was just saying how, because you kept hearing, well, you didn't really hear, but it's the, what you heard from the Vietnam War, like how Viet Congs weren't exactly falling by the rules. Close, but how did we hear about the violence? The right. Television, nightly news coverage, every single night on the news, 6 o'clock news or 5 o'clock news, you got a report on the war. And were those scenes and those videos sent back to the United States, were they non-violent scenes? No, they were violent scenes. So the nightly news coverage is one example. Anybody got another one? Night, I'm going to rephrase that. The nightly news coverage of the war daily. How about another one? The riots. News coverage of protests and riots. News coverage of the protests against the Vietnam War, which sometimes include riots. Didn't the riots even have the violence in that? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So news coverage of the protests against the war and what that led to. Also, the third one, every night you got a what? A, what kind of a count every night? A body count. So, daily body counts reported back to the United States. Every time the news was on, 37 soldiers were killed in Vietnam today. I mean, 47 more injured. I mean, every time... No, not names. But every time they would give a body count and injuries. Every night. So, the Vietnam War was... a what helped make the decade more violent. The second thing was something called the consumer culture. Anybody know what the consumer culture is? What's a suit consumer culture? Let's see if I can find something here, just a second. This can be the consumer culture. Um, this shirt I bought is a consumer culture. What is it? Things you purchase. Well, here is things that were a change in the consumer culture, things people were purchasing a little bit different. All of a sudden, movies, and we're going to talk about this, became more violent. Things you see on movies today, the violence, would have never been tolerated in the 1960s, especially the early 60s. Have you ever watched the old westerns with John Wayne, even the ones before that? When they shoot somebody, do you see blood splatter all over? No. So there were some controls on movies until the 1960s, when movies started to become more violent, okay. Also, what was the most? What was the? What was the best sold toys of the 1960s? GI yeah. Joes. Joes and Barbie Tommy guns. You know, play guns. Barbie dolls were kind of out. GI Joes, and I'll tell you a little story about GI Joes. I was going to bring one today. Uh, they first came out in 1964, and they matched up the Vietnam soldier. Basically, it was a soldier-based doll. In 1964, they came out. By 1968, because of some of the concerns about the Vietnam War, the G.I. Joe went from G.I. Joe uh, action figure, military figure, to G.I. Joe adventure hero. And they changed the entire, and I'll bring two different dolls and show you tomorrow, or Monday. They were two different philosophies. The first one was strategically military, and then they had to soften it up to make it more the adventure hero after that. Things changed. But a G.I. Joe from 1964, which I have at home in the box, without the box damage, thousand bucks. Easy. Because nobody saved the boxes. But toys were made of violent nature. Tommy guns. Man, do you remember those? You guys cry too young, but man, I remember when I was a kid, you get those plastic Tommy guns and you, you could actually pull them back and they'd go, pull it through and they'd go, I mean, they were the coolest things ever. Everybody had those. Toy soldiers. You know, the little package of toy soldiers. So toys became more of a violent nature. Music, records, became much more violent in the lyrics, the nature of their lyrics. Okay, Things that you never would have said in a record in the 1950s was blatantly displayed in the 1960s. Not only violent lyrics, but we'll talk about later also lyrics with tremendous drug messages. If you have ever listened to the Beatles and tried to figure out their... Okay? I get by with a little help from my friends. I get high with a little help from my friends. When that, when they, the Rolling Stones had a song like that on the Ed Sullivan Show after the Beatles that refer, referenced to high, and they had to change the, they had to change the lyric. And every time Mick Jagger would sing the new lyric, he would roll his eyes. Serious, because he was mad, he had to change the lyric. That's how conservative they were. Okay, the third thing that I'm getting to, 
that really changed our view on violence was television itself. Okay, and you've, you've talked about some of this. Not only was there violent coverage of the Vietnam War on television, as I think Caitlin said, or somebody back there, the violent coverage of the civil rights protests and the fire hoses being shot onto the protesters and people beaten and the Watts riot and the riots in Detroit. All of those things were on television nightly. Coverage of the Vietnam War, violent coverage of the civil rights protests. How about continued reminders the whole decade? We spent how much time on this? The assassination of President Kennedy, the assassination of Lee Harvey Oswald, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., and the assassination of Robert Kennedy, which we're going to get to. Four, well, not, I wouldn't say four, maybe three major assassinations, and then a numbskull that got shot. But three major leaders in our country assassinated in a five year period of time, from 1963 to 68, three major political figures assassinated. So it was a very violent decade. Okay? Any questions on violence in the 60s? Okay, we're going to move on to the drug culture in the United States during the 1960s. And I'm not advocating marijuana or LSD to you today. I am simply telling you what the situation was then. Okay? But there's more to it than that. So the drug culture in the United States during the 1960s, I'm going to give you one, two, three, four, five, five major examples of the drug culture across America in the 1960s. Okay? Number one, motorcycle gangs. What's the most famous motorcycle gang you know? Wild, Wild Hogs. Hogs. Wild Hogs. <laughs> Hell's Angels. I've, I'll tell you a story about, I know Sonny Barger, the head of the Hell's Angels, personally. It's an interesting story, but I'll tell you in a minute. But the Hell's Angels was one of many motorcycle groups that sprung up across the nation. Do you know how motorcycle gangs started? Anybody know? Let me tell you a quick story here. At the end of World War II, we had a surplus of motorcycles that were used in the war, which were sold to consumers in the United States. And a lot of people were interested, and they formed motorcycle groups. Okay, pretty normal people. Well, there began to be the formation of some groups that were doing things they shouldn't have been, and it gave motorcycle groups a bad rap. And one guy that was pretty famous of, of starting these peaceful groups of motorcycle riders for leisure said, well, you shouldn't blame all of us for what 1% of the people do bad. Anyway, somebody dinged here. What was that? Nobody's taking advantage, okay. Anyway, so these guys got kind of offended by that comment that, you know, that we're one. So they gave them their self the name, the one percenters. And so these motorcycle groups that were upset at the people that were causing all the trouble that were 1% of the problem, they took pride in that and they started calling themselves one percenters. Well, the first motorcycle gang to really pop up was the Hells Angels. But I'm not making this up. They didn't start as the Hells Angels. They started off, they were called themselves, I'm not making this up, the pissed off bastards. <laughs> no, it's honest to God truth. And they had a patch on their coats that said 1%. One percenters. They eventually transformed into the biggest and most well-known motorcycle gang of our history worldwide, the Hells Angels, who have, you know, chapters in every part of the world, let alone the United States. When I gave this speech, I gave used to give a term paper, and, and um, I had a student in my class that wanted to do his report on the Hells Angels. Well, Sonny Barger is the head of the Hells Angels. He's probably in his late 70s right now. And he lives in Cave Creek, Arizona. And we got basically got on the internet and found him and called him on the phone. And Sonny basically tutored this kid, Brent Waller, through his Hells Angel paper. It was incredible. And he even he got a this is quite a, he even got a kick out of this. He'd never been asked by a school to help him with the term paper. So anyway. When I went to Sturgis one year, he was, the Hells Angels were selling memorabilia in this, they rented this office building, they were sell, selling memorabilia in the front, 
and probably dope in the back. But anyway, I walked in with my wife, who you know my wife, if any of you know her, she's pretty shy. And we walk in there in our motorcycle guard. I walk in, I say, hey, can I talk to Sonny Barger? The guy says, who the hell's asking? I swear to God, he asked my wife. And I said, well, you, you, you tell him, so Randy Dewar's here, a history teacher from Montana, and he'd like to visit with him. And this guy looked at me like I was on drugs myself. And he walked back to the back of that room, and he walked back up, and I had Todd Heberly and his wife were friends of mine with me, and they were crapping their pants too. Because, I mean, this was not a good-looking place we were in. And the guy says, Sonny said he'll see you. And I'm not kidding you, they walked us back like he was the... They were protecting the President of the United States. And I went back there with my wife and Todd Heberly. I'll bring it, I got a picture, I'll, I'll show you. Sonny and I. Nicest guy I ever met. How things going? How's that kid doing? I help with the paper. Sonny Barger's not a bad guy. He just is a, he, he's not a bad person. He's a bad guy. I mean, his group sells drugs and kills people and does, does those type of things. But he actually is a pretty good fellow. But anyway, these motorcycle groups uh, led to the drug culture because they, they basically trafficked, trafficked drugs. That's what they do for a living. Okay? So that's our first example. And I'll, I'll bring you some pictures of Sonny Barger and I. Trafficking of drugs. Yeah. Okay. The second factor leading to the drug culture was marijuana. For those of you that don't know how to spell it, hopefully none of you. M A R I J U A N A. M A R I J U A N A. Now, I'm not an idiot, and I realize the impact marijuana has made a tremendous comeback from the 60s to now. I mean, kids use it all the time. Hell, it's legal in Colorado. My personal opinion is uh, to legalize it, just tax the hell out of it. That's what I would do. You know, I have my own opinion on that, and I'll probably stay away from it, but I'll probably tell you anyway. I can tell you this much. More lives have been ruined, and more families have been ruined by the use of alcohol than it has marijuana. But anyway, it's, it's illegal, and that's the way it is. It was first outlawed in 1937. First outlawed in 1937, marijuana. And it was used in the 1960s by almost all of America's youth. Not everybody, but a huge percentage of America's youth in the 1960s were using marijuana. And I'll tell you right now, those people in 1960 that were using marijuana at, at 17 years old are still using it at 87. If you think they're not, you're crazy. Because I'm telling you, it was a generation. That's so she, um, her, like, it's her sister, but she's older, and she always is. Well, I'm telling you, it's just, marijuana. it is, I mean, it is what it is. If you use marijuana in the 60s, chances are pretty good that you still use it. Why? Why did kids use marijuana? Because there was basically five advantages for the youth culture to use marijuana. Five advantages. Why, why they did it so much. Okay, so again, marijuana was highly used by America's youth in the 1960s, very common. One of the reasons they used it is because it was cheap. That that was not very much money. I can remember when I was in college in 1978, 79, 80, you had no, no trouble affording it. <laughs> number, number two, I knew we were going to get this. Happens every year. Number two, it's very, it's very available, and you can, you can compare. You guys, I don't know anything about it now. I mean, I, you know about it, but I'm telling you. It was cheap. It was cheap in the 1960s. It was actually pretty cheap in the 1970s. And I don't think it's that expensive today. I don't buy it. To be honest yes, with you. Really? Um, it, was, it, was a, it was available in the 1960s. Easily available. It, it was easily available when I was in college and high school. And it's still easily available. Okay? What does it do? It heightens a person's form of perception. Okay? It heightens a person's form of perception. Have you ever watched Tommy Boy? Yes. yes. When he's seeing the bugs come onto the... Onto, onto the <laughs> so it heightens a person's form of perception. It also usually will break down inhibition, similar to alcohol. You know, somebody that's not very outgoing, get a couple beers in them or have them smoke a little dope, they normally will be a little more outgoing than normal. They lose their inhibition, some people that are shy. You know, some people, why do people, why do some people drink and smoke marijuana? Because it, it, it gives, makes them feel better. They're, maybe they're not feeling good about themselves, or maybe they're real shy. I know, I know a lot of people that, you know, if you're going to have to go give a speech or something, in the old days, I remember you get, went and gave a speech, you always had a couple of beers to kind of get you settled down so you could give the speech. I'm telling you, it just was not unusual. So it broke down inhibitions. And it was widely acceptable. Okay, not a big deal. It's probably not much different today, and I, I, I would tell you, I'm pretty honest, 
smoked marijuana, not when I was in high school. Smoked a lot of marijuana when I was in college. <laughs> but have not smoked any honestly, have not smoked have not smoked any marijuana, honest to God, since the day I got married. So that's thirty-four years without you want to say. <laughs> not, I didn't the night before. Although the night before I get married, I can't speak for all my, my groomsmen. I had one of them get his nose broken in a fight down at the uh, well, this bar down here. It's closed up now. But well, I didn't have a broken nose. She didn't care. But if I'd have come home with one, it'd have been a different story. But Randy Tedlin said the wrong thing to a Hispanic guy. Bam. I mean, right. Anyway, it was down at the. It was a bar down here that's kind of down by Maggie's. I don't. Uh, bear, three bears? Ask your parents if they remember the three bears in Moreland. Unbelievable. Anyway, back to marijuana. <laughs> so it was cheap, available, it heightened a person's form of perception, it broke down inhibitions, and it was widely acceptable among young people. Okay? Yes? Oh, I was yes. hand on the mic. No. I oh. Uh, can you hear that? No. Okay. I guess I don't want to hear it. Number three. And I never pronounce this exactly right because it, it's like Massachusetts and Czechoslovakia. Usually I can get it the first time, but I screwed up after that. Lyser lysergic acid diethylamide, better known as LSD. And that's what we'll go. But I didn't want you to know exactly what it was there, so I did put it in the IDs. You will not be responsible to write that out on your test. You. That drops. <laughs> so lyseric acid diethylamide, I think, I don't know. It's better known as LSD. Now this is an inter this is an interesting drug, and I think it's making a bit of a comeback. Yeah. Okay, question, you know Grateful Dead? Yeah. Were they on LSD or marijuana? We'll tell you. It's coming up. Wait, what? what did you use LSD? Grateful, Grateful Dead? Dead? Never did. Never, that, you know, LSD was not, LSD, seriously, that's a good question. Blake, I don't care if you ask, did you ever use LSD? Never did. It was more of a 60s drug than 70s. And I was, in 1969, I was 11, so I was a little young. But, but no, I didn't, but, but it's making a little comeback. Now, LSD is a chemical, and it, act, it actually was accidentally developed by a Swedish scientist in the 1930s. So LSD is a chemical that was actually accidentally developed by a Swedish scientist in the 1930s. The LSD is a chemical that was accidentally developed by a Swedish scientist in the 1930s. Now it's a hallucinogenic drug. What's a hallucinogenic drug? Where's Where's this morning? What I is it? It's a it, it gives you uh, kind of like yeah, seriously like visions of things, and we'll talk more about it. But it was a hallucinogenic drug that basically people took to go on a trip, and sometimes these trips were good, and sometimes these trips were not so good. Now here's what LSD does. So pay attention. It produces marked deviations from normal behavior. Okay, it produces marked deviations from normal behavior. What's a deviation? A change. So produces marked deviations, big time changes from normal behavior. So it produces marked deviations from normal behavior. Now, does anybody know what serotonin is? Yeah. It's a happiness chemical. Well, kind of. Well, not it's exactly. It's a chemical in your brain that, that makes you feel happy. Good. Close. It's a chemical in your brain that affects your nerve impulses. So it does make you happy, does make you sad, does make you anxious, does make you whatever. But what it is, serotonin, and I'll spell it if you're interested, S-E-R-O, S-E-R-O-T-O-N-I-N, S-E-R-O-T-O-N-I-N. Serotonin is a transmitter of nerve impulses in your brain tissue. So you're correct, it makes you feel happy, makes you feel sad. Well, what LSD does, it inhibits that action. It inhibits the action of serotonin so that you are not getting those feelings that you normally would get. Thus, you hallucinate. Okay? So again, LSD inhibits the action of serotonin. And serotonin, again, is that transmitter of nerve impulses in your brain that make you happy, sad, whatever. Now, if you were to take LSD, it usually acts within 30 to 60 minutes. 
It usually takes 30 to 60 minutes for it to get moving. And once you get it moving, it can usually last 8 to 10 hours. So if you're having a good trip, that's awesome for 10 hours. If you're having not such a good trip, it's no fun. And it can stay in your body and actually give you effects several days. So it all depends on the person, right? The person's serotonin, the person's, I don't want to know if I want to say attitude, but their demeanor. So if he takes LSD and I take LSD, he could have the best trip of, the, of his lifetime. He could win the lottery in his hallucination. He could fly to the moon by himself without any, you know, help. And I might end up in the bowels of hell. I mean, seriously, you do not know. So it's a kind of a, a little bit of a risk when you take it. Now, here's some things it causes. Mood shifts. Good or bad, right? Mood shifts. Time and space distortions. Okay, you might not know where you're at or what time it is. Your arm might feel like it's 15 feet long. I mean, seriously. So, time and space distortions. It also causes impulse behavior. Things maybe that you wouldn't do normally, you might just go for. So it causes impulse behavior. It also causes, for lack of a better term, paranoia, or increased suspicion of the intentions and motives of others. So if I'm on LSD and Blake looks at me and smiles, I might get the vision he's going to stab me and I might beat the hell out of him. Seriously, no. No, I'm telling you. So it increases suspicion of the intention and motives of others and it may lead to aggressive behavior. So you just are not anywhere near yourself when you're on this. It's, it's kind of an interesting drug. Now, do you know how it was first introduced to the United States? No. Close. <laughs> Close. Not the military, kind of. What organization used it first in the United States? CIA. CIA. Very good. And what they do, they gave it to people to try to question them. They used it as kind of a truth serum to try to, they gave it to enemies of the state, spies, etc. They captured, they give them a little LSD and see what they'd tell them. Sometimes they told them, Things that were probably accurate, and sometimes they probably didn't. So LSD was first introduced to the United States as part of a CIA program to question enemies of the state. Have you seen them when they give it to them, like an artist, and they take pictures of what he draws? So we're going to get to that. Eight hours? Yeah, we're going to get so to that. cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, LSD <laughs> was legal in most states in the Union until late 1966. So during the hippie movement we're going to talk about, for the first six years of the hippie movement, this was actually a legal drug. You could use it without penalty. 66? Anybody, 66. Anybody want to guess the first state that banned it? Colorado. California. <laughs> California. <laughs> and the drug finally became illegal in all states as a result of the Drug Abuse Control Amendment of 1965, which was passed in 1965, but some states let it go for a bit, and finally it was 66 when California was the first state to ban it. So the drug was actually deemed illegal as a result of the Drug Abuse Control Amendment, which is on your sheet, of 1965, isn't it? No. no. Didn't put it on there? Well, I'll read it again. It should be. Drug Abuse Control Amendment of 1965. The Drug Abuse Control Amendment of 1965 actually made LSD illegal. It was not until 1966, late in 1966, that California became the first state to declare it, and then everyone toppled pretty quickly after that. Now, the group that used it the most was the hippie subculture, and that's what we're going to talk about here in a bit. What, who, what, who were they? But the hippie subculture was the one that used it the most. And probably the pioneer in the movement of LSD was Augustus Owsley. The pioneer in the movement of the LSD use was a guy by the name of, of Augustus Owsley, who's on your sheet. So the critical pioneer in the movement of LSD was Augustus Owsley. 
Hey, you know anybody know what he was? He was a hippie, but in real life he was a chemist. He was from California. He manufactured several million doses of LSD in his life. Several million doses. Now, I'm going to tell you about a dose here in a minute. Is it like a shot or a pill? Or do you Perfect like question. I'll tell you what it is. It's an eyedropper liquid. And it was most common, a couple ways it was taken in the 60s. They had perforated paper. My son actually has... <laughs> now listen. <laughs> My son has an unused piece of LSD perforated paper that was owned by Ken Kesey, who we're going to talk about in a minute. Worth a lot of money. Basically, it was just a sheet of paper with perforated squares about that big. And they would put a drop of LSD liquid on it and then put it on, on your tongue. Sugar cubes were huge. Sugar cube, drop or two of LSD, that's how it was taken. I mean, you could take it lots of ways, but that was it. So, now, you can imagine that several million doses are drops. Several million drops, basically. Now, Owsley's efforts, he supplied the drug to several figures who became advocates for LSD. A novelist by the name of Ken Kesey, who I just mentioned, and a psychologist at Harvard University by the name of Timothy Leary were both big-time customers of Augustus Owsley. Okay, again, novelist Ken Kesey and Harvard professor, professor of psychology Timothy Leary were big-time customers of Augustus Owsley. And answering somebody's question, because I'm getting old, Owsley was also the personal supplier of LSD to the rock band, The Grateful Dead. Woo. So they used both, yeah. but they were big-time LSD users, and they got their LSD from Owsley. Did it be your some other songs? Oh, yeah. Did you make a lot of money there? No, he didn't, no. I mean, it was just more of a, let's get going, man, let's use it. It was a hobby. Wasn't it? Was, no, 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 he's right. No, Sean is very accurate. It was much more of a hobby than it was to make money. That's what it was. Now, the popular beverage for the young generation in the 60s was a mixture of LSD and Kool-Aid, also known as electric Kool-Aid. But LSD was a huge, huge drug in the 1960s. Huge. Huge drug. Dropping acid is what they called it when they took LSD. Gonna drop some acid. Okay? Now we're gonna move to the fourth example, and the example is Timothy Leary. He is the example. Mm -hmm. Timothy Leary. Does the professor only have one? No, I think two. No. No, just one. We're going to tell you a little bit about Timothy Leary. Interesting guy. As I mentioned, he was a professor of psychology at Harvard University, one of the most prestigious universities in the nation. How did he get away with using LSD? Well, you're going to see if he did or not. We're going to see if he did or not. Okay. Now, Leary was the most public figure in the 1960s to promote it. Owsley made it, and he supplied it, and he promoted it some, but Leary's the one that went out and really promoted people to use LSD. Now he was kind of an interesting guy. When you first think about him, you think he's kind of flaky, but he actually was born in Massachusetts in 1920, and he attended West Point Military Academy. He was a graduate of West Point, and actually served in World War II in the military. So he was not some knucklehead flake. He went to the West Point. That's not equal, easy to do. Graduated from West Point, you come out of West Point an officer, and he served in the military in World War II, serving his country. What year was he born? 1920. Attended West Point Military Academy, served in World War II. He got his doctorate degree from the University of California, Berkeley. That was kind of the hub of the counterculture, which we'll talk about later. He got his degree, doctorate degree, from the University of California, Berkeley, and he actually taught at the University of California, Berkeley, until his first wife passed away. So he earned his doctorate degree from the University of California, Berkeley, taught there until the death of his first wife. When he moved to where? 
He went to Harvard to become a psychology professor after leaving Cal Berkeley after the death of his wife. So he moved on to a very prestigious Harvard University as a psychology professor. Now, remember, LSD was not illegal until when? 1966. So when he was at Harvard, he actually conducted legal psychological experiments with drugs in the late 50s and early 60s. So as a psychology professor, he tested the effects of these drugs, legal drugs, on people, including himself, in the late 50s and 60s and reported his findings back to his students. That was part of his job. He was a psychology professor. He was seeing how that wanted to be done. However, he got fired in 1963 when they, the university found out he was using his students in his classes and his research. He was giving these drugs to his students, even though they're legal drugs, they're illegal to give to people that aren't you, so to speak. So they fired him in 1963 when they discovered he was using the students in his classes and his research. <clears throat> Now this is when he really started speaking as an advocate of hallucinogenic drugs, especially LSD. He went all over saying how great they were and how you should use them. Okay? He even founded a group called the League for Spiritual Discovery when he moved to upstate New York after his firing from Harvard. So after he was fired from Harvard, he really, really promoted the use of hallucinogenic drugs, especially LSD, he moved to upstate New York and founded what was known as the League for Spiritual Discovery. What do you think that was? It's just kind of a, your own what? Well, club? <laughs> Spiritual Discovery. Basically his own church. Kind of his own religious organization. So he founded the League for Spiritual Discovery. And he had a congregation of followers, religious followers, just like the Catholic Church does, and the LDS Church, and the Methodist Church. He had a congregation of religious followers that belonged to the League for Spiritual Discovery. Did they talk about religion? Sure they did. But as a symbol of peace, instead of taking communion or passing the plate, they passed joints in church. No, as a symbol of peace. I'm not making it up. So, you know when you go to church, every church does their own thing. In the Methodist church, after the pastor gets everybody lined up, everybody stands up and says, Nice to see you, man. Let's pass the peace. Nice job. Yeah, good to see you, Calvin. In those days, it was, hey, baby. <laughs> right? So, and that's what they did. No, that's what he did. He was out of his mind. Did he mean for it? Does it actually, like, be abbreviated as LSD? Yeah. I'm sure that was intentional. <laughs> Anybody think? Good question. You, I think you might be right. Now, so he started speaking to America's youth, and this is the advice he gave them. He went around speaking to America's youth, and he advised them to, quote, turn on, tune in, and drop out. That was Leary's advice to America's youth. Did I make that up? No. Turn on, tune in, and drop out. Now I will show you different videos throughout the rest of the year on, on these types of things and you'll see Timothy Leary in some of these things. But he went around and advised America's youth to turn on, tune in, and drop out. Basically the last 20 years of Leary's life he spent writing and lecturing across the United States. That's what he did. He spent the last 20 years of his life writing and lecturing across the United States. All about LSD? Yeah, everything, LSD and life in general. Did he ever get remarried? Yeah, he did, but I couldn't tell you a lot about it. Now, he died of prostate cancer, unfortunately, on May 31st, 1996. He died of prostate cancer on May 31st, 1996. This is Timothy Leary, folks. He died of prostate cancer on May 31st, 1996. He was cremated, and his remains were launched into space on February 9th, 1997. So he died of prostate cancer on May 31st, 1996. He was cremated, 
and a portion of his remains were launched into space on February 9th, 1997. Wait, so does LSD have like one of the negative effects, or why did he live so long? Yeah, you know, I would not say LSD has a ton of negative effects. It, it didn't obviously cause prostate cancer. It's a, it's a high that's hallucinogenic. And like I said, everybody's built differently. Everybody's wired differently. And so what it does, did for Blake wouldn't necessarily do for Kellen. And that was part of the problem, is these guys would take this together and then everybody would act differently and it would just be weird. Okay? Now, how many people are going to be gone to activities tomorrow, please? Raise your hand. One... Okay, two, three, four. Okay, we will not lecture tomorrow. We will find something to do. Here's what I think we're going to do for those of you who are here. I think we're going to watch. They finally released, I may or may not, they finally released live recordings of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, and I watched it last night. I recorded it. It actually, you can hear LeMay's voice say to President Kennedy, you're in a pretty bad fix. And he said, what did you say? That whole conversation, you can hear it live. So we may watch it. But the real people? Yeah. Who? Or I might watch the Hall of Fame. I might watch. Oh. I might bring in the Hall of Fame rock concert, maybe get some of these groups we talked about. We'll see. Oops. How many are going to be here tomorrow? Going to. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about seven or eight, nine. Okay. All right. We'll figure something out. What do you want to call this? Let's call this. Um, LSD. 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 LSD.